A lot of training and preparation happen before a smoke jumper takes that leap to fight a wildfire. Down here is more of the business end of what we do. Josh Cantrell, the training manager at the Smoke Jumper Base in Redmond, Oregon, gave us a tour of the facilities and showed us what all goes into the profession. You may not know that smoke jumpers make all their own gear. That includes their jumpsuits, harnesses, and personal and equipment bags. Everything except the parachutes. We refer to this space as the sewing room. Others will call it the manufacturing room, but the gist is the same. It's we purchase bolts of fabric that come in rolls, and we have patterns for, and there's some more down here, but we have patterns that we lay out on these tables, cut them out, and then sew them together with all of these, with this equipment, with this sewing machine. He asked Cantrell why smoke jumpers make and repair their own gear. I believe the origin, as I would tell the history of it, is for our manufacturing and um, and use of this equipment is that we're a small group of people that originally there weren't anybody, there was not a manufacturer out there that could essentially do the research and design and development of this equipment. Um, that remains today uh, the case because there are really not the same number of uh, smoke jumpers out in the system. There's not a retailer out there that really does what we need, makes what we need um, on, on the scale that we need it. So this is a, a jumpsuit and the equipment that we use is um, mostly uh, purpose built that there isn't a retailer or a manufacturer out there that does create this stuff the way we're using it. Um, and you know, again, this stuff gets damaged and we need to be able to continue to use it. So we build it, we repair it, and if something does get damaged, we can, we can fix it in a timeline that can put it right back into service. Here in the chute well, the parachutes are inspected after they've been used on a deployment. They're looking for any damage to the parachute. Maybe, you know, pine cone punctured it. Might be some brush or something that punctured it. Maybe this parachute, uh, the jumper treed up and it is, is damaged, but that's what we're doing. We're looking for any damage, identifying the damage, um, you know, the location of the damage, and flagging it so that it doesn't get jumped before it gets fixed. After inspection and any repairs, the chutes then go to the rigging room to be packed and readied to be jumped. It gets laid out on this rigging table. Attached to the point here, risers on one side, lines. All these lines get another continuity check to ensure that they're clear, no twists, not one, you know, wound around another one. Yep, no damage. Um, it's laid out, you know, this is the nose, and then the opposite end is the tail. That's, that's the way it's packed every single time. Tail on one side, nose on the other. If you were to think about this, that makes the parachute is packed on its left-hand side, or, yeah, on its left side. And then it is essentially S-folded into a container, uh, into a deployment bag, and then put into a container. But the way we pack it and, and teach it and pack it is um, the same for every one of our riggers or parachute packers yep follow follow the same procedure standard operating procedure you know follow it every single way to the same specifications and, and instruction to easily pass down and teach so there's no discrepancy between the way one person is taught and rigs versus somebody else you know again we're sort of in between seasons right now but the basic gist of it is that all of our all of our equipment and supplies come out of the airplane after we're on the ground, and it comes out in a, in a box. This box has food, water, uh, sleeping bags, tools for two people for three days, basically. Comes out on a 16-foot parachute, um, and then hopefully into the jump spot and not, you know, in some place where we got to go find it or climb for it. Our basic hand tool is a Pulaski, and this one's got its, you know, the guards on it, but it's got an axe end and a grub end on it for chopping and then digging, generally. Um, and this is the primary tool that we're going to use. Now, we do have other tools that we can use uh, based on the fuel type that we're in, and you mentioned the chainsaws. That's another big part of it. This is, you know, a small end of a professional faller's chainsaw, um, that comes with either a 28, sometimes a 32-inch 
uh, chainsaw bar that we will use to cut the stuff that you can't chop when you're, get, when you're getting around the fire. That's got fuel, it's got all the stuff that you would need um, to you know, operate the chainsaw and get around the fire. Obviously, if it's a large fire and you're doing a lot of cutting, you just request more fuel. You can always put in, so I, I've been using three days as the basic time frame for these fires, and the bulk of the fires that we go to are gonna be in that time frame. There are larger fires that we do respond to where the resource needs uh, exceed that three day period of time. And so we'll ask for more food, more water, more chainsaw fuel, all the equipment we might need. In the wilderness areas of our public lands, we are often asked to use non-mechanized means of cutting. So we also have crosscuts and maintain our own crosscut chainsaws, or excuse me, crosscut saws um, for use in those areas where it's non-motorized. When the siren sounds, the ready room is where the firefighters run to suit up and board the plane. Smoke jumper Joe Madden has his gear and parachute ready to go at a moment's notice. And then they load up on a plane, fly to a remote fire, float to the ground, and then go to work. 